Good evening. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rick Chess. I direct the creative writing program here, and I also am a member of the literature and language department, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this evening's reading. Uh, I'm not actually doing the official introduction. I've given that honor to a good friend and colleague of mine, D. James, who I will call upon in just a minute or two. But first, I want to tell you about a couple other things coming up, one this semester and one next semester. Um, and there will be other things that will develop over time that you'll hear about as well. But this coming Sunday at 3 o'clock in the Laurel Forum, our graduating seniors in creative writing will be doing their reading of their original works of fiction and poetry. Um, it's a great chance to get a sense of what the up-and-coming writers are up to in their own work. So um, I recommend that you take a little time out on Sunday afternoon and join us for that reading and help celebrate the accomplishments of some of our graduating seniors. Uh, next spring, um, I know there will be more readings than the one I'm about to announce, but I'm very happy to announce that Maxine Cuman will be reading here on April 1st. Uh, um, and we're very excited that uh, she's going to be able to join us. Uh, I'm as excited about her coming as I am about the reading that we're about to hear tonight. Um, and uh, though I am going to give the honor of doing the introduction to my colleague, I just have to say one little word, at least, a, a half of a sentence or maybe a full sentence. I shouldn't speak in half sentences. Uh, that there are lots, there are dozens and, you know, hundreds of interesting poets working these days in America and around the world and doing all kinds of pleasurable and surprising things with language. Uh, of those hundreds, maybe there is a group of about a dozen or two dozen who actually are what I would consider to be wise poets, poets who we can turn to uh, for a sense of clarity, for a kind of deeper spiritual sense of our lives as we enjoy the remarkable things they do with words, we can also benefit from their wisdom. And I really think that Marilyn Nelson is one of those poets that I would put in the category of the wise poet of our time. Um, and so for me, it's a special pleasure and honor to have her with us. And I thank her for coming. And now I'll turn to my colleague, Dee James, um, who will do the official introduction. And so please, Dee. <laughs> So, again, thanks, Rick. <laughs> I'm very honored to be able to do this introduction tonight. Um, Rick asked me, and I'm really supposed to be working someplace else, and my boss is sitting over there, but I, I ditched work. Don't tell her. She might not notice. Because um, this, um, Rick gave me an opportunity to read um, the collection of Marilyn Nelson's poetry. Um, I had not met her before, and so the things that I'm telling you are um, factoids that I garnered from um, various places. But um, she was born in Cleveland, Ohio. She's the daughter of a serviceman in the Air Force, Melvin M. Nelson, and a teacher, Johnny Mitchell Nelson. She was brought up on military bases. They said all over military bases. A BA from the University of California, Davis, an MA from the University of Pennsylvania, a PhD from the University of Minnesota. Um, she had so many prizes, so I just selected a few. Prizes for the fields of praise, new and selected poems. Was a finalist for the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize, the National Book Award, and the Penn Win Winship Award. Um, the Penn Winship Award. Um, her book Magnificat won the Amosfield Wolf Award and was a finalist in the National Book Award. Carver, A Life in Poems by our own Front Street Books. Um, so it was a wonderful book and I hope that you all saw the copies out there and that you'll all be going out to get them if you don't have them already. Um, she has two Pushcart Prizes, two Creative Writing Fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, a Fulbright 
Teaching Fellowship and the 1990 Connecticut Arts Award. She is the Poet Laureate of Connecticut and on and on and on. And I hear she currently teaches at University of Connecticut in stores, but I hear that she's on a Guggenheim this year. So lucky you. Lucky you. <laughs> right. Um, as a reader, I am most struck by what one reviewer described in this way. An award-winning poet, Nelson crafts the poems to near transparency so as not to intrude upon the story she's chosen to tell. And I have to tell you that the thing that draws me to all of her poems, more and more to her poems, is the wonderful stories that she tells us through them. Um, wonderful stories, wonderful characters we're introduced to. It is right and fitting that Dr. Nelson be our honored guest tonight in this particular series um, that honors our, my friend and colleague, Dr. Peggy Paris, who is a uh, fiction writer. Both of them teach us in their work the primacy of story, the imperative of story, the necessity of story. Dr. Nelson's work brings us news of the hearts and minds of the characters who people her poems. Her, poet, her, her poetic persona included, and the Tuskegee Airmen, and Jonah, and Jacob, and George Washington Carver. She provides passageway into their worlds, and so more deeply into our own. For that, we are all most grateful and ready for transport. <laughs> Thank you. I'm pleased and honored to be here this evening. I want to thank all of you uh, for coming out. And I can't see the clock there, so let me just take off my watch so I don't overstay my welcome. I think I read for about 40 or 45 minutes. If you're up for that, you can synchronize your watches. <laughs> I uh, thought I would start with a story poem. I'm going to read um, two or three sections of a, of a story poem. Um, about this time last year, I was invited to write a poem for a museum in Connecticut, the Mattatuck Museum, the museum director called me and asked me if I could write a poem honoring a set of human remains that the, the museum owns. Um, I didn't even know what that meant. And it turns out that this museum owns a skeleton and that it's a historical museum and they had done some research about this skeleton and had discovered that it was a skeleton of an 18th century slave named Fortune who was a slave in Waterbury, Connecticut just before the Revolutionary War. He was owned by a doctor, and I put quotes around doctor because there were no medical schools. Um, this is somebody who was a, basically a bone setter. Um, uh, Dr. Porter was his name, and um, he, Fortune and his wife and children were owned by this, this Porter family, and when Fortune died, apparently by an accident, they think he fell, um, he, um, the doctor did something which was at that time illegal. Um, he prepared the skeleton and hang, hung it in an office in his home and started a little medical school to teach people how bones are articulated. This was, it was against the law to do uh, human dissection at this time. Uh, and so he was breaking the law, but it was one of the first medical schools in the continental United States. So when I first heard the story, I was just horrified that this man could prepare the skeleton of someone he knew. And then I did some reading about the history of um, medical schools and realized that there was a, a reason for this. So this is a, a long poem. It's supposed to be done with music. The Waterbury Symphony is supposed to be finding a composer to uh, set this to music. Um, so it's, it's long. I'm only going to read three sections. Um, the poem is called The Manumission Requiem. 
And again, I read three sections. This is the preface. Uh, one thing uh, useful to know, I think, is the fact that um, Connecticut has lots of stone walls that were built during the uh, this colonial era. And um, we don't think of people in New England as, we don't think of slaves as being in New England, but um, it's a piece of American history that I think is interesting and useful to know. Fortune was born, he died. Between those truths stretched years of drudgery, years of pit-deep sleep in which he hauled and lifted, dug and plowed, glimpsing the steep impossibility of freedom. Fortune's bones say he was strong. They speak of cleared acres, miles of stone walls. They say work broke his back. Before it healed, they say, he suffered years of wrenching pain. His wife was worth ten dollars, and their son a hundred sixty-six. A man unmanned, he must sometimes have waked with balled-up fists. A preacher painted water on his head, and fortune may or may not have believed, whom Christ offered no respite, no reprieve, only salvation. Fortune's legacy was his inheritance, the hopeless hope of a people valued for their labor, not for their ability to watch and dream as V's of geese define fall evening skies. Was fortune bitter? Was he good or bad? Did he sometimes throw back his head and laugh? His bones say only that he served and died, that he was useful even into death, stripped of his name, his story, and his flesh. Fortune's wife's name was Dinah. And uh, this is called Dinah's Lament. Miss Lydia doesn't clean the doctor room. She says she can't go in that room. She's scared. She make me take the dust rag and the broom and clean around my husband hanging there. Since she's seen fortune head in that big pot, Miss Lydia say that room make her feel ill, sick with the thought of boiling human broth. I wonder how she think it make me feel. To dust the hands what used to stroke my breast. To dust the arms what hold me when I cried. To dust where his soft lips were and his chest what curved its warm against my back at night. Through every season, sun up to star light, I heft, scrub, knead, one black woman alone except for my children. The world so white, nobody know my pain but fortune bones. This is, the, this is not the last section of the piece, which comes to, the piece itself comes to a kind of a resolution, um, but this is midway through. This is in the voice of, uh, of this Dr. Porter. He performed this dissection on a hill outside of town, uh, a hill called Abrigador Hill, and um, that's the title of this, On Abrigador Hill. For fifty years my feeling hands have practiced the bone setter's healing touch, a gift inherited by porter men. I have manipulated joints, cracked necks, and set my neighbors back to work. I've bled and purged fever and flux, inoculated for smallpox, prescribed fresh air and vegetables, cod liver oil and laudanum, and closed the lightless eyes of the new dead. And I've been humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. 
Herewith begins my dissection of the former body of my former slave, which served him who served me throughout his life, and now serves the advance of science. Note well how death softens the human skin, making it almost transparent, so that under my reverent knife, the first cut takes my breath away. It feels like cutting the whole world. It falls open like bridal gossamer. And I am humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Standing on a new continent beyond the boundaries of nakedness, I am forever changed by what I see. The complex, delicate organs fitted perfectly in their shelter of bones, the striated and smooth muscles, the beautiful integuments, the genius strokes of thumb and knee. In profound and awful intimacy, I enter fortune, and he enters me, and I am humbled by ignorance, humbled by ignorance. Let's see. I will, uh, I think I'll switch to Carver. And um, I read first a poem. George Washington Carver was born in 1864 in a small town called Diamond Grove, Missouri. He was raised by the white couple who had owned his mother. She was stolen and not returned. Um, uh, and when he was 10 or 11, he left their home to go off in search of a school which would accept him as a black child. The local school wouldn't. He spent about 15 years traveling around the Midwest, going from school to school, um, getting an education. Um, this poem is written in the voice of the the f woman he lived with when he first left home. Uh, she was a um, midwife um, in a small village in, in oh. Missouri. Her name was Mariah Watkins. The poem is in her voice, and it's called Watkins Laundry and Apothecary. Imagine a child at your door offering to do your wash, to clean your house, cook, to weed your kitchen garden or paint you a bunch of flowers in exchange for a meal. A spindly ten-year-old, alone and a stranger in town, here to go to our school for colored children. His high peep brought tears, sleeping in a barn and all that. Nary mama nor kin, but only white folks he left with their blessing, his earthly belongings in a handkerchief tied to a stick. I've brought a house full of children into this world, concentrating on that needle's eye into eternity. But ain't none of them children mine. Well, of course, I moved him on in. He helped me with my washings, brought me roots from the woods that bleached them white folks' sheets brighter than sunshine. He could fill a canning jar with leaves and petals, so when you lifted the lid, a fine perfume flooded your senses. White bodices and pantalettes danced around George on my line. He was sweet with the neighbor children taught the girls to crochet, showed the boys a seed he said held a worm, cupped hands warm so it wriggled and set the seed to twitching, gave them skills and wonders, knelt with me at bedtime. He was the child the good Lord gave and took away before I got more than the twinkle of a glimpse at the man he was going to be. It happened one Saturday afternoon. 
George was holding a black-eyed Susan, talking about how the seed this flower grew from carried a message from a flower that bloomed a million years ago, and how this flower would send the message on to a flower that was going to bloom in a million more years. Praise Jesus, I'll never forget it. He left to find a teacher that knew more than he knew. I give him my Bible. I keep his letters in the bureau, tied with a bow. He always sends a dried flower. I'm skipping around. This um, book pretty much tells um, Carver's life story. When he was about 14, he, uh, he was in Fort Scott, Kansas, and he witnessed a lynching. And um, I was trying, all of these poems are told from different points of view and different voices. And I think, how am I going to tell this story? I don't have anybody. He was alone. I can't, I, I didn't, at, th at this point early in this project, I didn't trust myself to try to write in Carver's voice. I didn't know him well enough to do that. Um, so this is a, a poem that's, you have to just take it on faith, right? This is a poem that's written in the voice of a field of wildflowers. Okay. It's called The Perceiving Self, and it's this incident. The first except birds who spoke to us, his voice high and lilting as a meadowlark's, with an undertone of wind song, many petaled as the meadow, the music shaped and colored by brown lips, white teeth, pink tongue. Walking slowly, he talked to us, touched our stamens, pleasured us with pollen. Then he squealed, a field mouse taken without wing beat, with no shadow. His yellow feet crushed past running, his bare legs bruised, he trampled, his spew burned, his scalding urine. The ice drift of silence, smoke from a torched dead man, barking laughter from the cottonwoods at the creek. This is, uh, Carver graduated from high school in a small town in Kansas, and then I'm trying to tell this in shorthand. He graduated from high school, he applied to a small college in Kansas. They accepted him and offered him a scholarship. He sold all of his belongings to get to the town where the college was, and when they got there and realized he was black, they rejected him. He had to stay on for a year doing laundry to uh, make enough money to get out of town, and then he went and homesteaded on the prairie in a sod house alone for a couple of years in Kansas. And then he, was, he applied to another college in Iowa and was accepted. This college remembers him very dearly. Um, this is a poem about this early days of his being in college. Um, this is in 1891. The poem is called Cafeteria Food. Even when you've been living on wild mushrooms, hickory nuts, occasional banquet leftovers sneaked out of the hotel kitchen by a colored cook and weeds. Even when you know it feeds you mind and body, keeps you going through the gauntlet of whispered assault as you wait in line. Even when it's free, except for the pride you have to pay by eating alone in the basement. Even when there's a lot of it, hot meat or chicken and potatoes and fresh baked bread and buttery vegetables. Even when there's dessert. Even when you can count on it day after day. Even when it's good, it's bad. And cover... Uh, uh, graduated from and got a master's degree from Iowa State University and then was invited by Booker T. Washington to join the faculty of the new institute, Tuskegee Institute in um, Alabama, which was um, founded to uh, educate the children of the former slaves. He uh, went there thinking he would stay for a couple of years and wound up spending the rest of his life there. and. Um, I just read a couple of stories from um, from this. 
this um, picks up, well, actually, maybe I'll read an earlier one first. Um, when Carver first went to Tuskegee, he was hired to start uh, a school of agriculture and science. There was nothing there. There was no equipment. There was no laboratory. And um, so he had to start from scratch. The only equipment they had was a microscope that had been given to him when he finished his uh, master's degree, when his professors gave him a, pro a microscope. That was it. So uh, this is what he did the first couple of years he was at Tuskegee. The poem is called Chemistry 101. A canvas apron over his street clothes, Carver leads his chemistry class into the college dump. The students follow a clack of ducklings hatched by hens, where he sees a retort, a Bunsen burner, a mortar, zinc sulfate. They see a broken bowl, a broken lantern, a rusty old flat iron, a fruit jar top. Their tangle of twine, his lace. He turns a six-inch length of copper tubing in one hand. Now what can we do with this? Two by two, little lights go on. One by hesitant one, dark hands are raised. The waters of imagining their element. I'm skipping to a later point in Carver's life. I'm imagining him here as um, being in his 40s and having to read with glasses, having to wear spectacles. Carver was kind of, he was a mystic and a dreamer, so he's kind of absent-minded. Uh, so that has something to do with this poem. And let's see if there's anything else that you need to know. I'm thinking this is the, f the light bulb, the incandescent light, has just been invented. So that's important for the poem, and I think that's it. The poem is called Bedside Reading. In his careful welter of dried leaves and seeds, soil samples, quartz pebbles, notes to myself, letters, on Dr. Carver's bedside table next to his pocket watch, Folded in Aunt Mariah's Bible, the bill of sale. Seven hundred dollars for a thirteen-year-old girl named Mary. He moves it from passage to favorite passage. Fifteen cents for every day she had lived. Three hundred fifty dollars for each son. No charge for two stillborn daughters buried out there with the carver's child. This new incandescent light makes his evening's reading unwaveringly easy if he remembers to wipe his spectacles. He turns to the blossoming story of Abraham's dumbstruck luck, of Isaac's pure trust in his father's wisdom. Seven hundred dollars for all of her future. He shakes his head. When the ram bleats from the thicket, Isaac, like me, understands the only things you can ever really trust are the natural order and the Creator's love spiraling out of chaos. Dr. Carver smooths the page and closes the link on his own, excuse me, Dr. Carver smooths the page and closes the book on his only link with his mother. He folds the wings of his spectacles and bows his head for a minute. Placing the Bible on the table, he forgets again at first and blows at the light. Then he lies back dreaming as the bulb cools. I just read one more poem about Carver. These are all, they're all at true or more or less true about uh, anecdotes about his life. And this is a, a, a story, um, Henry Ford. Carver became a, a great and famous inventor. These were the days of Thomas Edison, and 
people like that. Carver was up there with Edison, but he, he was a very spiritual man. He, I think he was a mystic. Uh, and he didn't believe in patents. He didn't believe he should make money off of his inventions. So um, he gave them away. So we, we use his inventions all the time. If, you use, if you've ever eaten drunk soy milk or uh, soy cheese or tofu pups or tofuti, those are Carver inventions. Fruit roll-ups, powdered milk, powdered eggs, those are Carver inventions. Um, among, uh, he invented many, 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 many uh, of them, but uh, one of them that I think at this point everybody should know about is he invented gasoline, diesel fuel, and motor oil out of peanuts. And I really think this is the time that we should know that. Um, um, because he gave his inventions away, he had a lot of friends who were rich uh, industrialists. And one of them was Henry Ford. And this is a story Henry Ford used to tell about Carver. The poem is called Mineralogy. And it's important to, to remember that Carver was born in Diamond Grove, Missouri. The only thing he still wanted that a millionaire could buy, Ford's good friend answered, was a big diamond. In Ford's mind, on Carver's long, skinny, wrinkled anthracite finger, a stone to dazzle an entire classification system of eyes. Ford told how he bought a flawless, many-carat stone, had it set in a masculine ring, and sent it off gift-wrapped. When next in Tuskegee to visit Carver and throw some money around, Ford asked where the ring was. Carver lovingly set aside several dusty shoeboxes of specimens and opened a box labeled minerals. <laughs> he showed Ford his phosphate pebble found in an Iowa creek bed, his microcline feldspar found in the Alabama woods, his smoky quartz kicked up by his boot toe in a Kansas wheat field, his fluorite sent by a Kentucky spelunker, his marcasite sent by an English mineralogist in exchange for a piece of information, and here it was, his diamond, the gift of his dear friend Henry. Carver held the ring up to the window. Ford saw by its faceted luster that Carver's eyes weren't black, they were brown. No, they were sparklets of citrine light. I'm going to switch now to another um, another book. I think I'm going to read a, a few poems um, about a character, a kind of holy man I've kind of invented. His name is Abba Jacob. He's a hermit who's trying to uh, he's trying to live a holy life. And um, I'm just going to read a few poems. These are the, uh, poems that are um, written in imitation of um, the apothems of the Desert Fathers. The Desert Fathers were the first Christian monks. They lived as hermits in communities of hermits. Funny. It's like when I was in college, we, there was a campus organization called the Juxtaposed Anarchists. They were juxtaposed, but they weren't organized, you see. Um, the, the, the Desert Fathers though, lived in communities of hermits, and they lived very ascetic lives, and stories about uh, some of them eating one bean a day. Um, and there are some stories about them, uh, their sayings, that have been collected and passed on over the centuries. Um, um, and um, each of them is called Abba, which means father. And um, uh, so mine are in, in imitation of, uh, of those. And I'm just going to read about five or six of them. They're very small. I'm going to read them very quickly. Again, the character's name is Abba Jacob. If, sometimes I'm in them. And if I am, my name is Ama Mama. Um, so let me read them really quickly, and then I'll end with a different sequence. Uh, 
This is called Abba Yaakob and Miracles. One day, Abba Yaakob was praying in a sunbeam by the door to his underground cell, and the brethren came to him to ask him about miracles. One of the elders said, My mother's spirit came back and turned out all the lights the night we gathered for her wake. Was that a miracle? Another said, One spring evening, a white rainbow of mist passed over our heads. Was that a miracle? They went on like this for several hours. Abba Yaakob listened. Then there was silence. Big deal said Abba Yaakob. Miracles happen all the time. We're here, aren't we? This is called Abba Yaakob and the Businessman. A businessman heard about Abba Yaakob and went to see him about his difficulties with mental prayer. Abba Yaakob was planting trees. When the businessman saw him, he said, Boy, tell me where the cell of Abba Yaakob is. Abba Yaakob said, What do you want with him? The man is a fool. Oh, said the businessman, turning away. I heard he was holy. Abba Yaakob and the Theologian Thanking him for spending the entire afternoon and half the dinner hour discussing the various ramifications of the essentially paradoxical nature of faith, the theologian interrupts her first spoonful of lentils to lean forward again and cut off the flow of God. Reverend Father, she asks, what is the highest spiritual virtue? Abba Yaakob looks to heaven and groans. Humor, he says. Not seriously, of course. <laughs> Abba Yaakob's aside on hell. Abba Yaakob said, I wonder if souls are unhappy in hell. I rather doubt it. And if they are, they won't admit it like people in an expensive nightclub, glad-handed by the rich and beautiful, while the rich and the beautiful hold cold hands to a fire in a dustbin. This is the last one of these I read. I'm going to read two more. They're little. This is called The Simple Wisdom. Abba Yaakob said, there's a big difference between the mentalities of magic and of alliance. People who spend their lives searching for God have a magical mentality. They need a sign, a proof, a puff of smoke, an irrefutable miracle. People who have an alliance mentality know God by loving. And this is the last Abba Yaakob poem I read. It's called Abba Yaakob Gets Down. Abba Yaakob said, There was once a desert father who had a bad novice. One day the novice died and went to hell. That night the Abba went into ecstasy. He had a vision of his novice surrounded by fire. My son, he said, I pity you for being there. That's all right, Father, the novice replied. I'm sitting on three bishops. <laughs> okay, that's it for Abba Yaakob. And now I read um, about five or ten more minutes, five minutes. Um, I read some, some uh, historical poems. I really like doing historical research and... Um, I'll read um, a few poems that are that come from that. Um, I read three poems about my own family, and then I think I will end with a poem about the Tuskegee Airmen. My family, we the source, the original source of my family is a relationship between a slave woman named Diverne and 
a white man named Henry Tyler. Um, my family, we have this as a love story, and I'm telling it as a love story, not as a plantation rape. Um, this happened in, um, in Tennessee, and um, I'm going to tell, uh, I'm going to read uh, a few, three poems about, about this relationship. Um, this first one is called Diverne's Waltz. Diverne stands in the kitchen as they dance, laughing and flirting on the bare parlor floor. She's taken up the rug, glad for the chance at last to beat it free of sins outdoors. Her fancy cakes are popular. Her punch has earned light giggles from Miss Atwood's friends. She'd struggled at Miss Atwood's back to cinch that tiny waist. Miss Atwood looked right grand. Mr. Tyler asks for a water glass of rye. He's just enlisted, a dropout from law school. She notices something dangerous in his eye. Crazy damn white man acting like a fool. Taking her hands, Henry Tyler gives her a twirl and off they waltz. He swirls Diverne so fast her head kerchief unknots itself. He smiles down at Diverne's embarrassment and gasps. They blush. Hearing the whispers from the walls, he sees men grin. His father shakes his head. But that dark rose, he dances. What the hell? Who knows? Next week, next month, I could be dead. This carries the story. This is uh, called Balance. He watch her like a coon hound watch a tree. What might explain the metamorphosis he underwent when she paraded by with tea cakes in her fresh and shabby dress? As one would carry water from a well, straight-backed, high-headed, like a diadem, with careful grace so that no drop will spill, she balanced almost brimming her one name. She thinks she's something, stuck-up island bitch. Chopping wood, hanging laundry on the line, and tantalizingly within his reach, she honed his body's yearning to a keen, sharp point. And on that point, she balanced life. That whole diverne thinks she Mars Tyler's wife. And this is called Chosen. Diverne wanted to die that August night, his face hung over hers, a sweating moon. She wished so hard she killed part of her heart. If she had died, her one begotten son, her life's one light, would never have been born. Pomp Atwood might have been another man born with a single race, another name. Diverne might not have known the starburst joy her son would give her, and the man who came out of a 12-room house and ran to her close shack across three yards that night to leap onto her corn shuck pallet. Pomp was their share of the future, and it wasn't rape in spite of her raw terror and his whip. I'm going to end with um, some, I guess I have to confess they're war stories. I'm going to read two of them. My father was... Um, he graduated in the last class of cadets to, to uh, be taught to fly at Tuskegee. So he was officially one of the Tuskegee Airmen, but his class didn't go overseas to fly. So. But because of this connection, I grew up with a lot of uncles who were Tuskegee Airmen who had been flyers. And um, 
I, I, I have this book about my family history. It's mostly the Diverne poems are from that book. And it's mostly about my mother's family. And, um, and I got finished with as much as I knew about my mother's family. It felt like I should say something about my father's family. But my father never talked about his family. I didn't know very much about them, uh, so I agonized about it. And then it occurred to me that, that his real family, he was um, orphaned when he was in college. He was an only child. I mean, I, I knew some aunts and stuff, but he wasn't very close to them. But his real family were, was this group of black flyers he served with in the Air Force during the 50s and early 60s. So I started calling around and asking um, Tuskegee Airmen if they would give me their stories. And um, they were, of course, dying to have somebody tell their stories. So I'm, I'm going to read... Uh, one that was told me by a man who just died last summer. Bert Wilson was his name. He's a wonderful man. He's one of the famous ones. If you've seen the movie about the Tuskegee Airmen, the character who's played by the one who was on the Cosby show, he was the son on the Cosby show. I can't remember. He smokes. In the, in the movie, he's the one who smokes a pipe. Say it again. Jamal, Jamal yeah. Yeah, that character is based on this man, Bert Wilson, and um, this is Bert's story. He was the part of the, that, that group was called the 332nd Fighter Group. They flew fighters. They were the ones who flew escort missions for Allied bombers. Um, <clears throat> they call themselves Lonely Eagles, and that's the title of this poem, and I think everything in it is understandable, except there's one word that's kind of fake German, that I found on a class picture, my father's graduating class, he had written at the top of the page this word. You'll recognize the word when I get to it. So again, this is called Lonely Eagles. Being black in America was the original catch, so no one was surprised by 22. The segregated airstrips, separate camps. They did the jobs they'd been trained to do. Black ground crews kept them in the air. Black flight surgeons kept them alive. The whole group removed their headgear when another pilot died. They were known by their names, Ace and Lucky, Skyhawk Johnny, Mr. Death. And by their positions and planes, red leader to yellow wingman, do you copy? If you could find a fresh egg, you bought it and hid it in your dop kit or your boot until you could eat it alone. On the night before a mission, you gave a buddy your hiding places as solemnly as a man dictating his will. There's a chocolate bar in my Bible. My whiskey bottle is inside my bedroll. In beat-up flying tigers that had seen action in Burma, they shot down three German jets. They were the only outfit in the American Air Corps to sink a destroyer with fighter planes. Fighter planes with names like by request. Sometimes the radios didn't even work. They called themselves hell from heaven, this Spukwaffe, my father's old friends. It was always maximum effort. A whole squadron of brother men raced across the tarmac and mounted their planes. My tent mate was a guy named Starks. A funny thing about me and Starks was that my air mattress leaked and Starks's didn't. Every time we went up, I gave my mattress to Starks and put his on my cot. One day we were strafing a train. Strafing's bad news. You have to fly so low and slow, you're a pretty clear target. My other wingman and I exhausted our ammunition and got out. I recognized Starks by his red tail and his rudder's trim tabs. He couldn't pull up his nose. He dived into the train and bought the farm. I found his chocolate, three eggs, and a full fifth of his hoarded up whiskey. I used his mattress for the rest of my tour. It still bothers me sometimes. I was sleeping on his breath. I think I won't read another one of these Air Force stories. I'm just going to end with a very short poem. This is a poem. People are always asking me to talk about this poem 
To me, it doesn't seem like much of a poem. I'm going to read it because people are always asking me. It has the N-word in it several times. Excuse me, it's part of the what happened. This is a true story. For me, it doesn't seem like a poem because it happened. I was sitting, I, it's a story I had told several times, and once I was sitting at lunch with my colleagues, and yeah, we were just shooting the breeze, and I told them the story, and a couple of them turned around and said, God, that's a poem, Marilyn, write it down. It had never occurred to me before. So I'm going to read, um, read this as a, as a last poem. It's called Minor Miracle. Which reminds me of another knock on wood memory. I was cycling with a male friend through a small Midwestern town. We came to a four way stop and stopped chatting. As we started again, a rusty old pickup truck, ignoring the stop sign, hurricaned past scant inches from our front wheels. My partner called, Hey, that was a four way stop. The truck driver, stringy blonde hair, a long fringe under his brand name beer cap, looked back and yelled, you fucking niggers, and sped off. My friend and I looked at each other and shook our heads. We remounted our bikes and headed out of town. We were pedaling through a clear blue afternoon between two fields of almost ripened wheat bordered by cornflowers and Queen Anne's lace when we heard an unmuffled motor, a honk honking. We stopped, closed ranks, made fists. It was the same truck. It pulled over. A tall, very much in shape young white guy slid out greasy jeans, homemade finger tattoos, probably a Marine Corps boot camp footlocker full of martial arts techniques. What did you say back there? He shouted. My friend said, I said it was a four-way stop. You went through it. And what did I say? The white guy asked. You said, you fucking niggers. The afternoon froze. Well, said the white guy, shoving his hands into his pockets and pushing dirt around with the pointed toe of his boot. I just want to say I'm sorry. He climbed back into his truck and drove away. Thank you. Questions if there are any, but there probably aren't any, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there is one already. Yes. Yeah. They're in a they're in this book, The Fields of Praise. It's a new and selected. But oh I broke my watch band. But they're also in uh, in um, in a book called Mag Magnificat. Yeah. Find the historical background of the Yaba poems. The Abba poems, the Abba poems are they're based on a real person, uh, and the 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 um, the po the works that I'm imitating are the apothems of the Desert Fathers. You can there are lots of books that are collections of the Desert Fathers stories. The wisdom, if you look up the wisdom of the Desert Fathers, you can find a lot of them online. The wisdom of the Desert Fathers or apothems, which is spelled A-P-O-T-H-E-G-M-S. They're wonderful, really wonderful. Some of them are really funny. They're they're kind of like Zen master stories, sort of. Um, um, yeah. So. Um, my question was, I know your research about Carver and you became a mystic. Where do you remember what sources that you read that? Oh, any, you can read his letters, or there's a very good biography, uh, prose biography out 
that um, also makes it clear. He got up every morning at 4 o'clock and went out into the woods to what he called commune with the creator. He traveled around the country, even when he was uh, famous for, for his inventions. He traveled around the country giving talks about pr how to pray, teaching people how to pray. I think it was meditation, basically, or contemplative prayer. He was involved in the, in the um, early days of the YMCA movement. Um, he was one of the one of the major um, powers behind the development of the of the YMCA's. Could you repeat the <coughs> question just for the purpose oh, of the um, <coughs> um, She asked, "What? Where did I find? Where did? What, what, the, what led me to believe that Carver was a mystic?" Uh, and that I just said that uh, any if you read anything about Carver, it's there. It's definitely there. I think if if he had been born in in a in a different religious tradition, he would have been like Gregor Mendel, who was a monk. Um, uh, he never married. I think he was probably chaste or celibate all of his life. I think so. Um, and he was devoted to the to the idea of communing with the creator he believed that he said that nature is a vast broadcasting system and that if you just tune into it you hear god um so uh, uh, um I, 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 see, I acknowledge it in the back of this book i have no memory at all but uh it, there there it's a woman whose name is linda something I think it's in here someplace, but I don't know where. Um, there's only one full-length uh, biography of Carver written for adults, and it's that one. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Talk a little bit about your books we read. About did you feel it as a little kid? Did you did you try to did you try to make it? Uh, did you try to think it? Did Feel it. Read them in the post. Eight, yes. Well, some of them, some of them, I'm a lot. Some of them are written in 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 just classical metrics. Uh, I read some sonnets and some some uh, blank verse. It's just iambic pentameter, and the the free verse poems. I think I pay more attention to um, to melody than to rhythm. I when I'm writing. When I'm writing in, in receive forms, you know, you've got a form and it's got to go da 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 da. So that's given. But in free verse, I think I hear my voice or some other voice saying the words. And for me, it's a matter of up and down and pauses. And so it, I think of it as being more like melodic music. I have worked, I have a very good friend who... Um, with whom I have lived occasionally when I've been working, and you know I I would come into her, you know she'll be sitting at the kitchen table drinking coffee, and I come in and say, and I've got this I can't fit, fit, finish this line it has to go da 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 da, and she's very good at helping me find something that goes da 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 da, so uh, I don't know it's, it sounds crazy doesn't it? Yeah, you know, uh, if you're right it doesn't sound crazy. Yeah. Yes. Um, do you have a ballad that um, famous ballad of yours that's in a, a, a well, it, it's in the book that's edited by Kennedy and Joya. And yeah. Yeah, it's and the ballad of Aunt Geneva. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about that and if that's about um, your family history. It is. Yes. It's a. It's. I give up. I've broken my watch. My life is destroyed. Um, Yes, I, I, I went back to my grandmother's hometown in Hickman, Kentucky, and um, did some research about a couple of generations earlier. And there's a house there that was my family's house. And to, I don't know who owns it now, but the woman who lives in it, I don't know whether she is just taking care of it for us or whether it's her house now. But it's happened three times. I've gone there and knocked on the door and she says, oh, you're here, 
it's your house, I'll move out. She goes and lives with her daughter. And <clears throat> the first time I went there with one of my cousins, and um, sh this woman had been a very close, she'd been very close to a couple of my old aunts, 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 when they were old. And she took care of them when they were in their 80s. And she told me this story. So I accepted it and wrote it down. And then after the book was published, the home it was published in a book called The Home Place. Shortly after that book was published, I got a long distance phone call from a local historian um, who lives in California and, had, and knows the town. She said that I had my Aunt Geneva wrong that this wasn't true, but this is what this woman told me, and it, I like the story, so I, I don't know. I, I like the story, and I was thinking there's a poem by um, Robert Hayden, The Ballad of Sue Ellen something, I forget, um, which I had, and I, I was trying to kind of write to that Robert Hayden ballad. That's why it's mine turned into a ballad, so, yeah. Yes. Was it your idea to work with the symphony on the one poem for the museum? No, the, the, it was the museums. They want to honor the skeleton. They, they, they've they had it in the museum for about, probably about 40 years. It was, pre oh, it's great. So I didn't read the rest of it. This, this skeleton was passed on from generation to generation in this Porter family. So all of the children had the skeleton, and every generation of this family produced one doctor. And the last one who owned the skeleton was uh, the first woman to graduate from medical school at Johns Hopkins University. She presented the skeleton to the museum, and she said she remembered on rainy days, the kids would go upstairs to the attic and play with these bones. They would play like golf with a leg bone and a skull. They grew up with a skeleton. And then the, they gave it to the museum and nobody knew whose bones. They thought maybe it was an Indian. So for a long time it was displayed in the Indian display in the historical museum. And then the, 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 the historical museums put some history. I don't know how they found out. They found all kinds of detail. They did forensic uh, research on the bones itself, themselves, so they s see that, the, that one of the vertebrae was cracked and healed, so they know he broke his back while he was alive, probably from hard work, and that it healed, but that he was in pain for the rest of his life. So they know all kinds of things about him, and they, they, they want, I don't know what they're going to do, the, there was a big debate when I, this was a year ago that I had contact with them they were talking about whether the, the the question was whether they were going to bury fortune give him a decent burial or whether they were just going to identify him now and and tell his story there in the museum um, but but to honor him they wanted to have this big musical thing and it got stuck because the conductor of the um, of the symphony orchestra There's been a disagreement about the composer, and so I don't know when it's going to be, when it will be premiered. It was supposed to be this spring, but I think it'll be a year late. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just so fascinated by this, this fortune story, and, and write, I love the poems, the poems that you read, but I wonder when you write a commemorative poem like that, when you're sort of commissioned to write a poem, and then you write from the heart, do the museum people say, no, no, this isn't what we want. We wanted something more celebratory or charged uh, light for No, they wanted me, they gave me a sheaf of, inf of pages of info. They wanted the whole story told. And right. so it was hard to, to get all of that into it. So, I mean, it, for me, it was a struggle not to write from the heart. The, 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 hard, the hardest parts for me to write were the the Abrigador Hill piece with the doctor speaking because, again, I was just horrified by this story. And then I started reading about the history of medical, uh, medical school. Most of, the, most of the early medical education in this country was based on slave bodies. The, that's, where, that's how they could get um, cadavers. Uh, and um, 
so that th I wanted to put that in, and that also that this was not just a kind of cruelty. This was this is what science is, and then the last part of it, which I didn't read, um, that in which I tried to make some kind of resolution. Um, I happened to go to a wonderful lecture given by Thich Nhat Hanh, the great Zen master, and he said in the course of his lecture that when people are terminally ill, the best thing you can do for them is to tell them that they are not their bodies, that they are something else. So I wrote a kind of a gospel song in the voice of fortune saying, I am not my body, I am not these bones, because the skeleton was just my temporary home. So as a way of, of resolving the whole thing and pulling out of this horrible story. Um, yeah. And is that going to be published? I, don't, I haven't sent it out for publication because I've been waiting to see what the museum wants to do. Um, um, so it, it will eventually be published, but I, I don't know when or how. So, yeah. I love it. You know, it was such a privilege to be asked to do it and, and not to have to do the research myself. I only had to do the medical stuff, and the rest of it was just all handed to me. It was, it was great. Yeah. That's a good place. Yes, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.